Good morning again, church family. My name is Davy Gibson. I'm the education and discipleship pastor here at Sugarland Baptist Church. This is our live streams uh, adult Bible fellowship, ABF time, that myself and our executive pastor, Jeff Moran, have been leading each Sunday since we started meeting remotely. And we are very thankful to announce today that we do have several pilot small groups that are coming back into the building starting this morning. It is such a blessing for us to be able to study God's Word each week, and we are so thankful for all of the leaders in our Bible studies that have been leading on Zoom platforms and, and other um, online meeting platforms during this time of, of, of social distancing as we try to keep our church friends and family safe, um, and we have actually even seen an increase in our Bible study attendance through the summer, which is sadly something that never happens in churches when it comes to those summer months. But due to the opportunities that people have had and the amazing leadership that we have with our Bible study leaders, we've been able to see sometimes 10 and 15 percent more adults each Sunday engaging God's Word together. Our, our pastor's class, our live stream class like this, is a monologue. I'll be sharing some thoughts and, as we go through our lesson this morning, and, and unfortunately, I won't get to hear back from you. And so that's why I always say, if you want to be in a small group Bible study, we want for you to be able to connect with people as you connect with God's Word together. Those other classes provide for a dialogue where people can talk to one another and engage with God's Word together. But like I said, we are excited that we have several pilot classes meeting here in the building, and those classes are um, being socially distant. They are continuing their Zoom component so that those that are not able to be in the building yet can go ahead and meet together. And so we are very thankful for those classes as they start to test technology and test our, our ability to social distance in our classrooms so that we can keep people safe and engage in God's Word together. And so these are some smaller classes that um, are really helping us out with this um, as we pilot classes back in the building. So we hope for the coming weeks as we continue to um, uh, try this out, we'll be able to have more and more classes come back into the building as we continue to regather here at the church, but doing so in a way that allows all of us to stay safe, allows all of us to, to um, re-engage with one another and re-engage God's Word each day. So we are so thankful that you worship with us, and now we're excited to jump into God's Word together. We are going through our study that is called Living in the Spirit. The book looks something like this. It's got a boat on the front. If you have your book, we're going to be in Lesson 4 today. It's going to come from the first chapter of the book of Acts. If you don't have a book, you can just open up to Acts in your Bible or on your app or open up another window on your device, whatever you're watching with. Um, if you would like a book, we're happy to put these in the mail to you or we can send you a PDF with all the, cop with all the um, lessons and then you can stay right with us as we study God's Word each week. Well, while you're opening up another window or opening up your Bibles to Acts 1 or finding Lesson 4 in your book, I want to open us with a word of prayer. Please pray with me. God, thank you. Thank you for the technology that allows us to meet today. Father, thank you that you are a God that is present with us whenever your people meet. And your word says we're two or three gather, and we definitely have met that here this morning. And so, God, we just thank you for this class, this group of people that are studying your word together. We pray that you guide and direct our thoughts that your Holy Spirit ministers to us and speaks through us as we study this, this passage of Scripture this morning, this, this vital instruction that came right from your mouth, Lord. So Jesus, guide and direct our time. Thank you again for the opportunities that, that we have here in our country and at this church to study your word freely. And so, Lord, we just pray you continue to keep us safe and healthy, that you be with those that are um, dealing with uh, medical issues this week or job and financial issues this week, that you are present in our struggles just as you are present in all of our triumphs and that we give you the honor and glory and praise. And we ask all this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, like I said, we're going to be in, at, in, in, we're studying the book of Acts, or, or um, we're looking at Acts chapter one this morning. It's lesson four, it's entitled Go Now, and it's just one verse this morning. And so after we've gone through entire chapters of the book of Daniel together over the summer in one week, now we get just one short verse, but it is maybe one of the most powerful verses in all of the Bible, and we'll look at it here in just a couple of minutes. 
So as I was growing up, I was very blessed to grow up in a Christian home with parents who loved me and taught me about Jesus at an early age. Both of my grandfathers were Baptist ministers for about 60 years each. And I tell people I, my, my, my life today is, is the product of praying parents and grandparents, those that loved me and prayed for me and guided me to make decisions in my life that would allow me to seek God's will in my life. And because of that, growing up in youth groups, I never really thought I had a testimony. Have you been in church where you had a testimony night and, or people came up and shared things that God had saved them from or been done in their lives? Well, I remember in my youth group, especially around church camp time, when we would have those, those church camp nights at the end of the day when everyone shared all the things that God was doing. I would have friends that shared about they decided to make um, a decision for Christ and they were going to stop a certain harmful behavior or they were going to stop doing a certain um, something that was keeping them from God's best in their life or they were going to run away from a relationship that was dragging them down. And there was always different testimonies people would share. Um, since I was one of those church people and even kind of went into the family profession later in life, um, I remember that I didn't really feel like I had anything God had typically had, had really saved me from. I didn't look at the, a past filled with drugs or alcohol or suicidal thoughts or depression or bad relationships. I had never had struggles with those things. Therefore, I never really felt like I had much of a testimony. Everyone else stood up and shared things and people cheered and clapped and went, oh, wow, hadn't God done a great work? And then I looked at my life and went, I, I went to Sunday school every day last month. What am I saved from? What's my testimony? What's my witness? Well, when we look at our verse here in just a moment, we're going to see the answer to that question. And it was actually an answer to another question the disciples had asked just a few verses earlier. So let's look now at Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. I'm going to read the verse through three times, especially since it's just one verse. And this is an ancient Christian practice called Lectio Divina. And it was started as a way of contemplative reading of God's word where a passage of scripture would be read and you would allow the passage itself to speak. And so I, I learned about this in seminary, at Truett Seminary in, in Waco, when we would sometimes pray prayers in a Lectio Divina fashion or would read scripture in a Lectio Divina fashion. We would read it and allow the word itself to just seep into our lives for us to hear the words over and over. So we're going to read this verse three times. I'm going to emphasize a different part each time as we begin to contemplate, as we begin to turn our hearts and our minds' attention to this one powerful verse in Scripture. These are the words of Jesus right as he was being taken into heaven following the resurrection. This is Acts 1, verse 8. Our Lord says to us, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witness in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Again. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witness in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. One final time. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. What parts of that verse jumped out to you? What were some words or phrases that you picked up on? First of all, these are the words of Jesus directly to his disciples right before he goes up into heaven. And he's speaking these words to them right after they had asked a very important question that we'll look now and just look at here again in just a minute. I've always felt like that this one verse has been a challenging reminder that God's call goes out to everyone. Everyone has a testimony. Everyone has an opportunity to witness the goodness of God. It's not just for people that are paid or professionals. And it's not just for those that have been saved from huge and major sins in their lives or made radical changes in their lifestyles. I always point out the statement, whenever I study this verse, you will be my witness. The act of being a witness is set in stone. 
It's not something that just those that have those powerful testimonies have, but all Christ followers are witnesses. It's not like you have to go through a certain training course and then you get to be a witness for Jesus. It's for everyone. So what is a witness then? Well, in a court of law, a witness has one responsibility, to tell the truth to tell what they know. We've seen those Perry Mason and those, those Matlock shows and those Judge Judys, and we love the courtroom dramas when they raise their right hand and they put their hand on the Bible and they repeat, I will tell the truth. That's what a witness does. A witness simply tells what they know. And to be a witness, and let's note, there's no option here. The question is not if we will be a witness. The question is only what kind of witness will we be, my friends? Is my life going to be that of a good witness or a bad witness? Is my life going to lead people to Christ or away from Christ? This is the only question here. Jesus has declared it. You will be my witnesses. So I remember as I was studying it in Waco in seminary, occasionally I'd have the opportunity to work at some of the, um, the benevolence agencies around Waco. We're finishing a book, and we're going to be studying it tonight for Men's Books and Burgers by Dr. Jimmy Doral called Trolls and Truth. And Dr. Doral started a ministry 30-plus years ago called Church Under the Bridge as part of his Mission Waco ministry. And, and this ministered to those that were in deep areas of poverty and deep um, needs in their lives, transitional housing situations. They were homeless and impoverished. And so Jimmy started to reach out to those individuals because that's how he saw Jesus living his life. And that's how he could be the best witness. And so there, was, there were lots of benevolence agencies around Waco. And one of these was called the Waco Crisis Center. It was done by the Waco Baptist Association. And I was working there one day. And I remembered a certain homeless man that walked in that day. Waco has an unusual high homeless population for a town of that size. And so this homeless man went in to seek benevolence that day. And part of this man's pitch in trying to seek benevolence, to seek people to, to either give him money or food, was he would always immediately start off any conversation with, are you a Christian? Are you a Christian? Are you a Christian? And that would then imply most people to say, oh, yes. And then that would be his then opening to say, well, then you should help me. You should give me what I'm asking for. And so he went to an old preacher that I was working with that day, and I'll never forget the conversation because he pointed at this old preacher and he said, are you a Christian? And the old preacher looked at him and said, Sir, I could answer that question, but I would rather you follow me around for the rest of the day and answer it yourself. What a testimony. This person understood, you will be my witnesses. My life will either lead people to Christ or away from Christ. You know, in our world, we've always put a high value on people's final requests and their last words. And entire organizations are created things like the Make-A-Wish Foundation to allow those that are in final dire situations to have a final um, good memory or uh, an experience with their families. We remember the last words of famous people. On July the 4th, 1826, two powerful presidents passed away, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. And John Adams' final words as he lay on his deathbed in New York was simply the statement, Jefferson lives, implying Thomas Jefferson had survived, that the country was still in good shape because he knew Jefferson was alive to continue the good work that they had been doing and dedicated their lives to in starting and founding this great nation. In actuality, Thomas Jefferson had actually died five hours earlier in Monticello down in Virginia. But we remember the statement of those great, that great man, our second president, that Jefferson lives. We remember his last statement because it was such a powerful statement. Well, our verse today is Jesus' last statement, if you will. These are the last recorded words of Jesus as he's standing on the Mount of Olives and about to be taken into heaven following the resurrection. And here is what he says to his disciples. They were given in a response to disciples' questions where they basically stated the phrase, are we there yet? We've been in those situations when we're with especially children in the car and we hear those phrases, that question from the back seat, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Well, this is the way the disciples ask. And they say it this way, Lord, at this time, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? 
When New Testament scholar N.T. Wright comments on this short passage of Scripture, he points out the disciples must have been completely puzzled. They thought they were signing on for a new Jewish renewal movement. And that's what they had been a part of for the last three years. And they had even asked for the highest place when Jesus' kingdom, his new world order, was going to be established. They had seen Jesus enter Jerusalem just like King David did in the Old Testament. As people threw down their palm branches, a symbol of Jewish power, a symbol of the Jewish nation, and they threw down their coats and they cried, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That enthronement psalm that was, that was memorized by all the good Jews that they would say on the day of atonement as the king, as the priest would head to the temple to make the sacrifice. They had gone through their years of training with him. Surely now was the time. Everything was in place. Except then there was the crucifixion. All their hopes and dreams were now dead. All we have here is another failed Messiah, they must have thought. The dream of Israel finally coming out on top and ruling all the other nations, allowing God to take his revenge on all those nations for the terrible way they had treated his chosen people over hundreds and thousands of years was finally going to come. And as N.T. Wright put it, all of this could be summed up in their phrase, Are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? But just as confusing as God allowing Jesus to be crucified must have been, so here we are with Jesus back again. And it's actually him. It's not a dream. We've walked with him. We've talked with him. We've eaten with him. Over 500 people had seen him. He's really back from the dead. So are our dreams of a restored Israel are now back. They're back on track, right, Lord? Is this the time? N.T. Wright continues, like everything else, the dream of the kingdom had been transformed through Jesus' death and resurrection. And so now Jesus had to explain that they had to lose their kingdom dreams of an earthly kingdom with ordinary administrative and governmental power in change and in, um, in, in charge of its subjects in order to gain what God really had in store. Because the point is this, it's not an earthly kingdom, it's a heavenly one. And it's already come to you. The kingdom has already begun through Jesus, Israel's representative that has been inaugurated the future reign of God through his death and resurrection. So all that is left now is for Jesus simply to say, go now. And he doesn't just send them empty-handed. That's when we get to the promise You go and be witnesses, but I promise you will not just go to just say, hey, Jesus is alive, but you will go in the power of the Holy Spirit. And see, that's what our lesson series is all about. This Life in the Spirit series is about examining the ways the Holy Spirit works throughout the New Testament church. Through all the books of the New Testament, we see the Holy Spirit is working constantly and in powerful ways. And to understand this is exactly how he will work in our lives too, as if we will yield to him. The word for power in that little verse, but you will receive power, is the word dunamis. Dunamis. It's where we get the word dynamite from. Now, dynamite typically destroys, and so maybe we need to rethink this power of more of might or strength or force capacity. But maybe a stick of dynamite is also what's needed to break down whatever keeping people apart from understanding who God is and who he has called us to be. And one of the first examples that we see of this power coming on someone and salvation being the direct result is when we look at the story a few chapters later of Philip and the Ethiopian. We find this in Acts chapter 8, and you can turn over there with me. Acts chapter 8, verses 26 through 40. We may be aware of this story. We may have heard it before, but it's a powerful story of how God is working and using his church through the power of his Holy Spirit. Dr. Luke writes in Acts 8, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. And he started out, and on his way he made an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of the treasury of Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship and was on his way back, and was on his way home, sitting in his chariot, reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. 
And the spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stand near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and he heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading, Philip asked? How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. And so he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. The eunuch was reading the, this passage of scripture. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, as a lamb before his shear is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The Ethiopian asked Philip, tell me, please, who is the prophet speaking about himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch asked, look, here is water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the Ethiopian went down into the water and Philip baptized him. When they came out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord took Philip away, and the Ethiopian did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at, an, at Az, Azotus and traveled about preaching the gospel in the towns until he reached Caesarea. Well, again, as we examine this passage, this powerful working of God's Spirit, this supernatural encounter, a divine encounter, we see that this was not something Philip thought up. He was not just sitting, studying, reading his Bible and went, I've got an idea. You know, there's that deserted desert road that goes from Jerusalem southwest, just like our southwest freeway out here. If, if Jerusalem and Houston were the exact same um, part, the Gaza Highway came out the southwest and it went all the way down to the town of Gaza on the Mediterranean Sea so that as you traveled back towards Africa, you would travel along this desert highway, but then you would get to the Mediterranean Sea and you could follow along the coast and then you could get to the Nile River Delta, and then you could follow the Nile all the way back down to Ethiopia and anywhere in Africa. This is how they traveled. And there was this major road, this desert road called the Gaza Highway. And it wasn't that Philip just decided to do some traveling evangelism one day. He was led by God. An angel prompted him, and then the Spirit told him that he shouldn't just pick any particular traveler. He should go to that traveler. And here was an Ethiopian. N.T. Wright notes that when we first look at this, we see that this is the first non-Jew to come to faith in the book of Acts, a black man from Africa. He's an outsider, but not for his race, but for his status as one who had been maimed. He was a eunuch. Nevertheless, he had great power and great influence. Dr. Will Willimon describes this person as someone from an exotic, far-off land to an ancient Near Eastern person. His home was on the edge of the known world. In fact, in Homer's The Odyssey, we hear of far-off Ethiopians being the furthermost of all men. So here is a fulfillment of Acts 1-8, the promise that the gospel will go to the very ends of the earth just a few stories later. And it isn't being accomplished because of an early church evangelism strategy or an outreach push. No, this is the Spirit of God throwing a stick of dynamite into the mix and the gospel is shared. The good news now includes everyone, even someone as outside of Judaism as you can possibly be, an Ethiopian eunuch. And in another few chapters, the believers will be described by those that are not in the church this way in Acts 17, verse 6. They are those who turn the world upside down. Something this life-altering, this universal, this widespread, this unhindered can't be from human origin. It is totally due to the Spirit of God creating something entirely new. Our lesson puts it this way. The believer has received the authority to be Jesus' witnesses and the abiding presence of Jesus through the reception of the power of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, witnessing is now the duty of every Christian every day. Day. In ancient times, when a new king came to power, it was the job of heralds to run, to carry the message throughout the land. And even those who may not like the new king in power, the government, or uh, knew that government and order is always better than anarchy. And regardless of how we feel an election will turn out in November, maybe we all need to remember a little of that too. Government is better than anarchy. So when a new Caesar or king was enthroned, good news had to be proclaimed across the entire land. 
Well, now we have a new king, a king of all kings, a king who will not ever come to an end of his reign, and it's the disciples' job to do exactly what Jesus has commanded them to do, to be those that herald this new order of things. And he's not just giving them, he's not just having them go in their own power, but he's sending them with guidance and power from his Holy Spirit. And so as Dr. Luke writes these words down that are going to shape, that, that shape his entire second volume of work, because this is the, the table of contents, if you will, for the entire book of Acts, N.T. Wright concludes that in Acts we sit back and we get to watch the journey take place from Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria and to the total ends of the earth. In fact, the book of Acts is sometimes called the Acts of the Apostles. We probably should change that to be entitled the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Because it's not just apostles that are going and coming up with new and innovative ways to reinvent Judaism, but a brand new movement of God has begun as his people are now his church. The people called by his name, Christian, Christ follower, and those that are carrying his good news that Jesus is for everyone, that God is for everyone, that it's not about where you were born in or, how, or what class system you're in, but God is for everyone. And that same call goes out to us. That same command goes to us. And that's the beauty of the book of Acts, is Acts never ends. When you finish chapter 28, simply turn the page and write your story. For we are Acts 29, the same call that the Spirit is going to give power to those that will yield their lives to the Lordship of Christ goes out over each one of us. And we get the same opportunity that Philip, Peter, James, John, the rest of the disciples, those first apostles had to go and proclaim to a world that desperately needs to know that God is still here, God still cares. Not only is that God has made a way to be in relationship with each and every person, that God has acted on our behalf, that the work is finished, and that we just have to put our faith in Jesus and align our lives with his way, and we get to be a part of his kingdom. So just pick up, just join in. The place is not on the sidelines, but in the middle of the game. The kingdom has come, it is coming, and one day it will fully come. So all that is left now is for us to go now. We've all got a job to do. Let's pray together. Oh, Lord, thank you for these words. Thank you for the call you've placed in our lives to go, to be sensitive to the movement of your spirit everywhere we go so that we have the opportunity to share your message. It's not our message. It's not that you've done something powerful in in just our lives, but you've done something powerful in the entire world. And we are sharing your message, your good news. Lord, forgive us when we lose sight of that. And continue to train us and gift us so that we can go in the power of your spirit to change your world. To be a part of this incredible call and command that you are our Lord, that you are our God, that you have saved us, that you are remaking all of us. So God, thank you for those that are watching. Thank you for those that will watch later this week. And thank you for this church and the ways that we get to continue to be a part of your forever family. To be a part of your kingdom in this place and around the world. So, Lord, help us look with your spirit eyes to see people around us that desperately need to know that you are for them, that you love them. We give you the honor and the glory and the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, thank you for being part of this class this morning. We're going to be back next week with our next lesson, and, and we look forward to seeing you virtually or back in the building as you are able to come back with us in the coming weeks. Please be in prayer for us as we continue to seek God's wisdom and and, and use the, the, the um, understanding of our situation, our need for social distance, as we continue to try to safely reopen and regather in this place, because it is so important that we meet together and study God's Word virtually and in person each week. We thank you for being with us. Have a great week, and God bless you.